from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 370, recorded live Thursday, May 2nd, 2013. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support. Online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklins.net, makers of Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft Connect for Windows developers. Details at GesturePak.com. In this episode, Scott talks with front-end developer Garen Means about developer monoculture. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I've got Garen Means with me today. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Brilliant. Uh, although not as good as you, because apparently <laughs> you, uh, I was asking you what you were working on and you were, you're, I said fun employed, but you have something even more interesting going on. Well, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's, it's, it's exciting. Definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm traveling around, um, speaking at conferences, um, while I, uh, because I committed to that before uh, leaving my previous position. And so I didn't want to start a new position having already committed to do that. That seems super fun, though. How is that different than, um, like, you know, a lot of these people are doing this journeyman thing where it's like, mm-hmm. quit your job and then just couch surf and code your way across the planet? <laughs> I, I, well, I'm not making any money. So, um, that primarily it's that. Um, so I, like all of this is like stuff that, that either conferences have, have very kindly sponsored for me or, um, or I'm, I'm out laying the cash for like random things like pet sitting and taxis myself. So. Mm-hmm. It's definitely hard. I don't think one can really make a living uh, running around speaking. Most conferences no. <laughs> don't don't give you anything other than uh, uh, conference food. Oh, I I think um, a, a lot of the conferences I've been lucky to be involved with like give you like plane fare and like a hotel. So that's great. It's like of course free travel. But um, yeah, it definitely um, doesn't doesn't satisfy your your day to day needs back at home. Yeah, exactly. I've talked to a number of people who think that somehow I'm making piles of money speaking at conferences. <laughs> I'm like, no, co- you know, co-chair fair domestically and the Holiday Inn is about as exciting as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> um, recently, you did a, uh, a talk at a conference called Bacon is Bad for You. What what mm-hmm. conference was that at? That was at uh, Devs Love Bacon in London. It was, that was actually the name of the conference. Yeah. Devs Love Bacon. Yeah. Um, was the conference about bacon? No, it was, it was about, um, the subtitle was things developers love. So it was about all kinds of things. And I saw amazing talks about like music theory and travel hacking and just a variety of things that you could potentially geek out over. Oh, like, like kind of like life hacks, just like, yeah, de- dev kind, life of, hack. kind of like life hacks. That seems like it, a very exciting conference. The only thing is I don't eat bacon. I don't, I yeah, don't, I don't eat pork. <laughs> I'm not a, I don't eat any pork. Oh, none at all. Yeah, my wife doesn't eat pork. So when we got mm-hmm. married, we made an agreement. Uh, it's funny. What the deal is, I don't drink and she doesn't eat pork. So when we got married, we traded. So now <laughs> neither of us eat pork and we don't drink. So wow. if we went, if, like, I had a, I did a post recent, I said recently, maybe a year or two ago about alcohol at conferences. Mm-hmm. And I started going to some, some kinds of conferences, but, you know, by 10, 30, 11 at night, everyone's drunk. Yeah. And that just made me really uncomfortable. So I just was like, you know, can we just not have any alcohol at a dev conference for once in our lives? And a lot of people really did not agree with that. And Mm -hmm. I kind of got dogpiled on. Um, (laughs) and now I was at a, I was at a really good conference recently called Code Mash. Uh, and they had a bacon bar. (laughs) Like it was just a bar that served nothing but bacon. And I kind of felt like it was a little, a little much. Yeah, I think JSConf does that as well. They have like, or at least one year that I went, they had they had just piles of bacon in um in burners. Yeah. <laughs> so so then you're at a conference called uh, Devs Love Bacon, mm-hmm. doing a talk called Bacon is Bad for You, mm-hmm. and you don't even eat bacon yourself. So uh, what is this talk about? And <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it wasn't really about bacon. Um, I just I actually submitted the talk because of the name of the conference as sort of a play on it. Um, but it was, it was more about the idea of, of the things that developers love and like, what are those things doing for us and are they helping us? And like, does that sort of way of defining a developer by the things he or she loves, uh, does, is that helping us? 
what should we be defining a developer by? Like, I've always thought that what Linus said, talk is cheap, talk is cheap, show me the code. Yeah. Was the really the best way. And then when I have, when I do talks on diversity or have conversations with people on diversity, uh, I always say that code doesn't really have a gender or a race. And while mm-hmm. I, ad- while I admire diversity and I l- strive for diversity of, all, of diversity of thought, Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, I just want to know if it compiled and passed the test. Yeah. I, I think that, I think that's exactly it. Like a developer is somebody who writes code. Done. So then that kind of takes a talk like, or, or a conference called what developers love and just makes it about code then. It kind of it basically says the premise of the entire conference that you're at is wrong. <laughs> like, let's all well, watch Big Bang Theory and, <laughs> uh, and Star Trek. Uh, I, I don't know if, I don't know if I would say the premise of, of the conference was wrong. I mean, it was still, it was still a fun conference, but I, I, I wanted to talk about the, like, most of the talks I saw at the conference were like about things that, that are not such sort of memes in the developer community, which was, which was cool. They were just random things you could geek out about, but, um, there, there definitely are like, you know, like Star Trek is is one that I mentioned a lot in the talk. Things that I think you're sort of expected to like as part of your identity as a developer, and maybe that is not such a great way to define developers. So does isn't this the definition? Uh, and I'm, we're not dogpiling on this conference. If anyone listens to this, I hope they understand that this this is about the larger issue and not in any mm-hmm. way about this particular conference, which sounds like a super fun conference to go it to. It was an awesome conference. Yes, yes, please invite me to come to this conference. Um, <laughs> But doesn't this promote monoculture? I mean, doesn't this basically say, you know, if you don't like Star Trek and if you don't like Big Bang Theory and if you don't, you know, you can't quote uh, Babylon 5, then you're probably <laughs> not going to be good at programming. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly the danger that that we 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 conflate the cause and effect there and and what's actually relevant um, because we get so used to, to sharing those things with the people around us. And like, we, like most of us, when we started out, like we, we got that, like that impression really strongly that we were supposed to be that kind of person. And so it enables us to relate to each other really easily. And so then when we're in any kind of not sitting down with literally the hands on keyboards, coding situation, it's, it's an easy way to be like, Oh, we're, we're buddies. We're like part of the same team. Go mm-hmm. developers. It makes me think about young people who are thinking about getting into programming because mm-hmm. it, it almost says you can't be a well-rounded individual if you choose this vocation. Yeah, exactly. That was, that was totally my feeling as well. Like that you, whatever, whatever your identity is outside of that, like you're, you're supposed to kind of suppress. And I've, I've definitely noticed that happen, like where people have, have interests that are considered like, especially if they're considered non-serious, um, like people will, I don't know, just, I guess just laugh at you, which is, which is not super, like not a big deal, but, um, it, 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 you definitely get the message that you're, you're not supposed to talk about your non-serious interests, um, in certain circles. I also noticed that some technologies can chop themselves up, their cultures up based on age. So mm-hmm. I'm a .NET guy, and there's the the kind of the joke about like old .NET people and their kids, right? You know, like everyone's over 35 and has kids. Mm-hmm. Well, like the Node community is early 20s, and mm-hmm. the, you know the Ruby people have a certain uh, style and personality, and there's a lot of free hugs, <laughs> um, and these kind of like cl- this clumping occurs. Within, mm-hmm. within code tech, within code, which makes me feel like, well, maybe I'm too old to go and become a node person, or maybe I'm not, I, I don't, I don't do enough vintage clothing, so I shouldn't be a Rubyist or, <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, oh, I don't yeah. want to do dot net. Those people are like, they've given up on life. Right. And they work for Aflac or something. <laughs> I would imagine Aflac's actually very good to work for. But I, I would I, suspect as well. They'd really have good disability, I would think. Yeah. Um, but I totally know what you mean. Like I, I'm, I'm in my uh, mid thirties myself and, um, being a, a front end person and JavaScript person, I, I definitely noticed that everybody around me is for the most part in their twenties, um, which is a little weird and makes me wonder if I'm immature for my age. <laughs> well, does, doesn't that make it that much more difficult to put yourself out there? And I don't necessarily mean speaking, but just, just showing up to work and presenting yourself, uh, you know, who, who, you're not one of us. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I think 
it's, it's again, going back to that idea of an adopted identity. Like I, I've learned to fake it. Like I, I, I've sort of learned to, to, to keep up with, with things like that, that the kids are into, um, so that I can, you know, like I can, I can still be part of those communities. Um, but on the other hand, like I have things that I do on my own that like, I don't really talk about in those, those communities, like working on my house or like the importance of like my pets in my life. Like a lot of developers I know who like fly all around the world don't have pets or like children or like spouses or anybody that they have to, they have to be concerned about like leaving at home. And like, I I don't know. It's, it's, it's different, but like it, it, it's definitely, um, there definitely is that segmentation there. And like, you definitely have to like, I think adopt the, the traits of whatever that segment is to, to fit in to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did a I did a blog post once on square foot gardening for programmers, <laughs> and then like all these like older married couples just oh this is amazing I didn't know I thought we were the only ones I thought we were the only ones that loved square foot gardening and you did it from a programmer <laughs> point of view, and then at the same time I'll have people unfollowing me for tweeting about my kids you know it's like you know. A, <laughs> I'll just put some harmless tweet out there. It's a day at the zoo with the kids and then pictures of the kids. And I was like, Oh, unfollowed. Not enough technical meat. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's a little unfriendly. Uh, yeah. They're a hipster. <laughs> <laughs> why, why don't we like hipsters? Oh, I, I, my, my theory is, um, I, I can't remember all the points that I had on the slide right offhand, but, um, you said they were unfriendly know it alls. Un- yeah, basically, unfriendly know-it-alls would would sum it up very well. Um, <laughs> yeah, and much like us. Yeah, ex- of course. Except we're older, experienced, get off my lawn, unfriendly know-it-alls. <laughs> well, yeah. But uh, I think that one of the points that you made in the talk was that punishing people for the wrong interests, uh, and I think we see that if you've ever seen Portlandia, it's mm-hmm. it's like a uh, you know you're and you're and you're in Austin and I'm in Portland, so it's this this kind of hipster central. Yeah. Um, but you know, if, if you don't, if you didn't read that article in the New Yorker and uh, <laughs> then, then you're not the right kind of people. Mm-hmm. Do, do, who, who do we want to join our communities and what do we need to do as, uh, as people who are talking on a podcast or people who are arguably out there in public to let people know, Hey, the water's fine. Come in. We want mm-hmm. you in our community. We want differing point of views and we want non bacon eating people. Well, I, my feeling is that, um, one of, one of the issues that we have is we don't want people to join our community because that dilutes the idea that, that we're all really kind of these special geniuses if, if just anybody can, can join. And so I think we, we like to set up sort of this, not, not quite hazing, but like something like it before we allow people into the, the core of like whatever our community happens to be. And, um, and when, when really what we should be looking for is just everybody who has the capacity to, to write code because that's how we get that diversity of ideas and experience. And then we become better coders. We write better software, et cetera. So, but I, I, I think we have, we have a real problem of motivation in terms of getting people into coding. And there's a lot of lip service paid, but when it comes down to it, like we're looking for people like us who, who validate the idea that, that we're supposed to be here and it's some sort of birthright. And I think that's, that's my own suspicion. I don't have anything to back it up, but that's how it feels to me. That's an interesting idea though. The, the, the birthright comment, that's a, that's a word with a lot of emotional baggage to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are, and of course we're talking in general, generalisms, generalizations, but the idea like, you know, I was, I was oppressed in high school and, you know, this is my right. You know, I'm smart, mm-hmm. I'm smart and this is what I was born to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I definitely had that feeling when I kind of discovered that I had some ability at this. It was like, ah, here we go. Revenge, right? This is, <laughs> this is how it's going to happen is that, uh, I have this superpower, right? You know, you're, you're beat up and then you get bit by the radioactive spider. And, uh, now everything is going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also the idea that, that there is no payoff, or at least in the short term for bringing people in that have diverse interests. Right. Like, is the, is the code better? I don't know. We'll have to go and build a cr- incredibly diverse and, uh, and exciting team in order to see. Mm-hmm. I've never seen any studies on that. Like, you know, we have fewer, uh, fewer test failures because our team has diverse interests. Right. I th- yeah. I think 
it's one of those things that I, I, I've certainly seen studies saying that the groups perform better with a diversity of ideas and backgrounds. And I, I feel like you can extrapolate that to say that you're, you're, you're just going to have better planning when, when everybody isn't sort of schooled to have the same ideas and the same approaches. Like you'll, you'll plan your software projects better, which will lead to better code and like better like division of labor when you have people who are interested in doing different parts of the system, um, all kind of working together. But yeah, I, I, I've never seen any studies either. It's just something I feel in my heart. Is that enough though for us to make a more welcoming community that we just, we know in our hearts, this is the right thing to do. Therefore we should try to be more welcoming. Well, I, for, for technical people, I would say probably not. I think we probably need some metrics, uh, <laughs> behind that, but, but that of course implies that, that we, we find, we find a widely diverse pool of people, um, with all kinds of interests and put them in a room for a couple of years and see what kind of software they're able to produce, um, assuming that they all get treated equally as, as developers and we don't sort of keep the, the classic developer who watches Star Trek like on a, on a pedestal. Um, and I, I think that would be a very difficult thing to, to actually test out, unfortunately. Hmm. The, uh, in the, in the talk, you were going on about how the caricature has become very public now, like our little mm -hmm. group has has uh people watching us now like we remember the revenge of the nerds movies mm -hmm. and things like that and that was kind of a uh pocket protector slide rule kind of a nerd but the the stereotype is now kind of been been owned mm -hmm. and now have been repackaged and turned into into television and movies and stuff like that the character is completely public now yeah <laughs> is that okay uh i i think it, it bothers me a little bit. I actually, um, I was just on a plane back from a conference and I, uh, I watched, I rewatched the social network on the plane and just like, like, uh, who is it? Aaron Sorkin, I think wrote the, the film. Um, mm -hmm. and he's known for his dialogue. And I, I was, I was thinking about like how the dialogue is like super clever, but the, the things that, um, that when he, when he tries to make like technical jokes or, or like just, show some sort of technical cred in, in the writing, mm -hmm. it, it comes across like with the same level of sophistication as, as hackers. Um, and hackers, the I, movie with Angelina hackers, the movie. <laughs> yes, which is a fabulous film, but, um, yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting that like p people are aware enough of, of sort of the buzzwords and like the, the things that are associated with, with, with what we do, but, they they still use those things to paint a picture of 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 this 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 nerd like this this sort of like social outcast like the I, I remember reading when when the social network uh, came out that um it was it was a mischaracterization in a lot of respects particularly one of the things uh, that I, I remember was that they'd mentioned uh, the the sort of driving force um in in the movie is that like he's trying to like impress or anger this girl. And in reality, he had like a steady girlfriend throughout that time who's now his wife, I think. So it just, just this idea that like, that like nerds are like romantically flawed, like it just was one of the things that kind of stuck out to me. Yeah. I mean, there is a certain amount of, uh, I mean, just to say that he created the, you know, one of the most successful companies and now, you know, a billion people on the planet because, you know, he really wanted to, you know, hang out with this girl. Yeah. Like he didn't just want to solve a technical problem, God forbid. He, he didn't want, and they never, they never want, uh, show the nerd as being a competent business person who had an idea and executed on that idea. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? That would be a really boring, uh, social network trailer. He had an yeah. idea. He chose to execute <laughs> on that idea. You know, I mean, no, yeah, there was a girl. Oh, Lord, here we go. Right. <laughs> yeah. So then does that cause people to kind of opt out? Yeah, that was, that was, that was, uh, definitely one of the things that, um, that I felt like I could back up. Um, so there's, there's this geek room study, um, a woman at, uh, the University of Washington did, um, where she, where she led these people into one of two rooms and asked them if they wanted to do computer science. One was like a very generic kind of room, very comfortable. Um, the other was essentially a comfortable room, but it was covered in like geek paraphernalia. And, um, she got, she got a much better response from the people led into this sort of neutral room than those led into the geek room. Um, just because 
people were like, oh, this is, this is not me. Like, this is something very, sp- well, I don't know. I don't know why they did it or why they said that. Um, but the, the results imply that, that people didn't want to be associated with, with that sort of geekiness. Um, or it, it made them feel, um, excluded in some way. Well, I could definitely see how that would make someone feel. People can feel excluded based on any number of things. It can be something that you can see, mm-hmm. uh, color or gender, or it could be, you know, something that how you, how you feel. I mean, this is why, uh, a, 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 an equal workplace is so important because if you're calling out someone because of any aspect of their personality, they're going to feel totally excluded and not and, and unwelcome. But they may yeah. never actually say it; they may just mm-hmm. disappear from the workplace one day. And you're like, exactly, what was wrong with that guy? Oh well, you know, it turns <laughs> out we were all eating bacon, and he totally was not into bacon. Yeah, but when does it get too PC though? I mean, someone listening might say, "Oh, come on, this is another diversity and technology talk," and you know, who who cares who who, uh, who has the opportunity or who shows up? Ultimately, the work gets done, and if it's all a bunch of uh, Anglo-Saxon white guys, why do we? You know, who cares? Right, and I, that's a that's a attitude that I think. Um, Definitely pervades everything. Even, even like, and it's, it's easier to talk about almost when you're talking about things like, like bacon or, or like drinking, like you mentioned. Um, because those are, those are things that, you know, we, we can change and like we don't, you know, we don't have to go around all the time, like even if we enjoy bacon or alcohol, like eating bacon or drinking alcohol. Um, but people still don't want to be, I, I think they, they perceive, um, being told what they can and can't have and can and can't do as, as some sort of threat and they're, that's, I, th- I think we just need to be better about that. We need to be a little bit more adult about being willing to have, have those kinds of conversations. Um, because right now, like you said, like it, I, I think that if you, if you feel uncomfortable, like with something that's happening in your workplace or like a conference or on IRC or whatever, like you really, your only option is to, is to leave because you're not going to get a good response. If you're like, Hey, can we, can we like stop doing this? This is making me uncomfortable. And we don't have a, we don't really have a good way of talking about that without everybody like flipping out and being like, you're trampling all over my rights. And it, it's unfortunate and kind of silly because it, yeah, it's, it's just pointless. I don't know. What about professionalism? This word gets thrown around a lot and I, I get accused of uh, being ageist because I'm like, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I guess I'm in my late thirties now right up against 40. And um, a lot of people are using this kind of get off my lawn comment around me a lot. And I'm just like, you know, the, the kids today, and you, you use that, you threw that term out there kind of lightly, the kids today. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, the kids today, they, they, they don't understand professionalism and they don't understand, uh, and, and is professionalism even required? Mm-hmm. I, I think we need some professionalism. I, I don't think we necessarily need the classic picture of professionalism, but I think we need to be willing to define professionalism. And I think that's our real problem is that we refuse to define it for, for our own industry. We don't have any idea of professional standards beyond just like the basics of like showing up to work and like definitely you have to check in your code, but like how we, how we act and behave like with each other as professionals, I think is something that we, we refuse over and over again to talk about. And uh, PyCon is a really good example. I think, um, just the blow up around, around everything that happened there, um, and how it was dealt with and were the comments inappropriate and all this stuff. Like the, to me, those are questions of professionalism. Is it professional to, to make off color jokes at a conference? And is it professional to take a picture of other attendees at a, at a conference and where are our standards? And those, those are all interesting questions that it would be good for us to resolve, but, that's not what happened. Everybody freaked out and people got fired. And I, th- I think that's what our community does over and over again uh, when presented with opportunities to clarify what we expect from one another. How could we, I mean, that was a, that was a complicated and multi-layered situation. Yes. And, you know, I think as they say, as with all scandals, mistakes were made on all sides. <laughs> uh, but I think your, your point was whether or not the off color comments were off color or not mm-hmm. and whether or not the picture taken was appropriate or not mm-hmm. frankly neither of those things matter because mm-hmm. the rea- the resulting reaction was so completely over the top right. and completely disproportionate to the original problem mm-hmm. that it in fact proves the original point right <laughs> right i mean the point was 
Uh, did she feel uncomfortable? Uh, were those jokes inappropriate? Uh, doesn't really matter yeah. because the resulting reaction by, you know, whoever and not necessarily people who reflected the developer community at large, although geek community was well reflected in the people who reacted. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I could totally see how anyone, uh, no matter what their gender or color would say, okay, this is not really a group of people I want to hang out with. Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, of, of, like we just poked the, poked the sleeping lion here. Yeah. yeah it was, oh, it, it was, was unprofessional. Yes, exactly. And, and, and you use the term, uh, asshole. We have an asshole problem. <laughs> yeah. In your talk. There's actually a really great book, uh, uh, there's a couple of, you, you, I hate to say asshole so much because people listen to this in the car with their kids. Um, but, uh, there's asshole driven development. Uh, Scott, Scott Birkin has a whole, whole post about that. About where the biggest jerk makes the decisions. Wow. Yeah, it's a this is like a real thing. Um, I think I worked there. Yeah. You probably worked. Yeah, I know. I may have actually been that guy. <laughs> and uh, there's a couple of books on uh, finding out, like if if you if you don't know who the asshole is on your team, it's probably you. Yeah, I've heard that one. Yeah, there's a great book called The No Asshole Rule about building a civilized workplace. That Sounds like a good baseline rule. Indeed, indeed. But do, do, does this mean that, that pr developers are simply need babysitters? Is this why managers exist? I, I, I think that that's why we have so many right now. I think that we could, we could probably do without as much supervision as we have right now if we were willing to, to sort of, to stop being assholes to each other, to uh, make that a priority in our communities that, that, is maybe not on an equal level, but like somewhere close to like, how much code do you check in? Are you writing, are you writing comments? Are you writing tests? Like, are you being an asshole should be one of those things that you check when you're doing any sort of professional coding work. I think if we want to, if we want to be able to, I don't know, be like, like conversely, I think that that would, that would provide us more freedom if we, if we were, if we were able to, um, agree on some, some, some freedoms we're going to give up, like the freedom to offend one another. I think that we would get more freedom out of that because we get less of these distractions and less of these like Twitter wars and everything else. And, and then we actually have more time to, to focus on what we're, what we're doing and we, we can exchange ideas and be good professionals and good developers. How do, how do we find an end point? Is there, is there an end to this? I mean, are, are, is, is civilized discourse like we're having right now the solution, or is this? Uh, we, we don't. I don't know how this culture got created. And I don't know how we're going to repair it. I, I think it's. I think it's. It comes from expectations, and I think that when when like like if you and I like are, are people on like we go and like go to our teams and like we have a certain expectation of professionalism, and instead of instead of just leaving like when when. Uh, things get uncomfortable. We're willing to like do the hard work of being like, Hey, that's not cool at work. I wish you would stop riding your razor scooter up and down the hallway, or I wish you would stop, you know, drinking in the middle of the day or whatever. I wish you would stop like using swear words to talk about our users. Um, whatever it is, like, um, just, just saying those things and being, being willing to be accountable for them. Um, and just having somebody say those things that, that, that might be uncool or like, you know, not, not, not super popular, um, ideas to, to consider in, in developer communities. Um, I think, I think that's where it starts. And like the more people you have saying those things, then, then it, it's sort of like any other kind of diversity. Then the people around you who are maybe scared to say those things can, can feel like that's a valid thing to say and be like, Hey, I wish you would take your razor scooter outside and play with it out there while you're at work or, uh, whatever the issue happens to be. And of course, this all depends on the culture that that, com that uh, company has chosen. Yeah, to, definitely to, to promote. You know, yeah. not to pick on razor scooter people, but if you've got a, <laughs> a, you know, if you've got a ping pong and pool, loud rock music at in, in the afternoons, and like beer from two o'clock on, kind of com company. Yeah, someone might think that's not professional. That seems a little bit um, dorm room to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, that's the culture that that company has kind of decided. Yeah, if it's coming from the top, I, I don't think you can really do anything but leave. Um, if you're not comfortable with that, which is unfortunate, but if it's coming from the top, then that's that's what it is, sort of. Yeah, it's a tough one though because I mean, no, no one wants to be the square, you know. Like, 
that's why I was so uncomfortable when I said, you know, I'd really rather not have a lot of drinking at these mm -hmm. developer conferences. Yeah, I think, I, I, I don't know. I think that, that, that there's sort of a false economy there because we expect all this, we, we expect, a, we've come to expect a lot of entertainment, um, from our communities, from our jobs, from our professional circles. And like, I see it. And I think, I think there are a lot of people like who, who are sort of coming around to this. And def definitely it seems more, more common among people who are a little older to me. Um, but it's, 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 you're, you're being given these things and being asked to stay at work to enjoy them instead of having the free time to go and do the things you love on your own. Um, which yes, you might have to pay for your own beer. You might have to pay for your own, uh, turn at the pool table. But on the other hand, you get to play, play pool when and where you want. You get to drink beer when and where and with whom you want. Um, and we, it, it's, it's a strange trade off and I don't know why we wouldn't want um, to define our, what we do at work a little bit more narrowly to not include those things because they might be, they might be good bonding exercises in some sense, but they're, they're, I don't know. I, th I feel like they, they take away time from our lives outside of work and, and make, make it a little dorm roomy. Like you said, um, you, you don't want to bond necessarily with the people you work with the way you would with the people you, you had to live with in college. Yeah, yeah. It's such a challenge, though, to to find the right balance. It seems to me like, kind of in wrapping up, that the balance is the word that everyone wants, right? Everyone wants to feel comfortable. Everyone wants to do good work. Everyone wants to have fun. Mm -hmm. You know, I like fun as much as the next person. <laughs> but at, at the same time, they want to do it in a safe and encouraging environment where they're not, uh, where they feel that their work is appreciated. Right. Without necessarily being a square. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. So people can see your talk on Vimeo and they can look at your slides on Speaker Deck. Mm -hmm. And they can check you out at Garen, G A R A N N dot com and see uh, other parts of your work. Of course, your work is front end development and uh, mm -hmm. presumably a lot more interesting to you than this topic that we've just spent the last half an hour talking about. <laughs> well, this is this is very interesting as well. I mean, I've been I've been doing this since the nineties and so I'm 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 very interested in sort of what what that's all meant, like to me as a person. So yeah. This is interesting too. Cool. Well thanks so much for chatting with me today. Yeah, thank you. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>